Welcome everyone. Very excited for today's webinar, A Complete Approach to Rain Screen Design. I'm gonna give folks a few minutes to join. Um, my name is Bo, I'm with ACE Labs. So we're helping out with hosting today's webinar um, with StoCorp and we have Kate and Brock here. Um, they're today's product experts who are going to be uh, presenting today's information. All right, and I'm going to just give a quick few minutes about Ace Lab and who we are, as well as show you how to find um, StoCorp over on Ace Lab's platform, and then we'll go ahead and get started with today's AIA approved presentation. All right, so quick snapshot of Ace Lab's team. We're started by architects for architects, um, and we have a platform that helps out with building product research and keeping everything saved and organized in the same place. Um, so this is kind of a little illustrative example of the problems that Ace Lab is working to solve. So just being able to get in touch with people easily, find your product and project data, um, you know, all in one space, um, and really be able to step, uh, cut down the steps in the product research workflow so you can get back to designing and, you know, doing the work that everyone loves as opposed to a bunch of admin work. So jumping over to our live site. I've signed in. Once you sign in, you get a great little custom dashboard view with all of the work you've been doing on Ace Lab. And just going to show you how to find uh, StoCorp on Ace Lab really easily. So you can just go over to the search bar in the top, type in the name of any manufacturer that you're looking for, and head over to their page. So we've got all of StoCorp stuff over here on Ace Lab. You can connect with them directly through Ace Lab's page, explore their products, as well as a great video about their systems. And I like to just explain that one of the things I find great about um, doing like even personally, just like jumping back and forth from different manufacturer sites on Ace Lab is that everything is formatted the same across product categories and across manufacturers. Um, so you can come and plug into products uh, with a really easy you know, workflow where you're not having to jump into multiple different formats. You can save these products right to your projects and to your account. And again, you can request information from the StoCorp team right from this page. All right, so that's my quick intro. Um, I've got a few housekeeping items. So the first is just that I want to uh, let everyone know, please submit questions to the Q&A. Um, we can pause if there are any relevant ones that come up during the presentation, but we will reserve some time at the end to be able to work through all of those questions. Um, and we will also have a record. So if your question does not get answered, no worries, we can follow up with you after today's event. Um, but yeah, please submit questions um, throughout today's event and we will love to get to those um, as soon as we can. Um, other than that, I wanted to quickly share um, a link to sign in for AIA members. So just to make sure that we've got your um, AIA number, you can fill out this form really quickly, um, just asking for your name and your number. Um, your credits will be reported directly to the AIA. Um, and I'll send that again at the end of today's webinar. So in case anyone missed it, if they joined a few moments late, I'll send that over again. Um, and then other than that, we're gonna have a few polls throughout today's webinar. So I would love any um, engagement that y'all can do over on those polls. And at the very end of today's webinar, we will release a poll asking for um, if you'd like to connect with today's speakers. So if you want samples, um, follow-up information, technical information. You can just let us know at the end of today's webinar on the poll. We'll go ahead and connect you with it, uh, the StoCorp team right on your Ace Lab account um, to make all that follow-up easy. So uh, other than that, I think that's all of my housekeeping for now. Um, but yeah, really looking forward to today's uh, presentation, a complete approach to brain screen design. And with that, Kate and Brock, you can take it away. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Abudarum. I am the rain screen specialist for the Northeast region. I'm actually based in the New York metro area. I'm joined by my colleague and uh, moderator for the day, Brock Osborne. Brock, you want to give a quick intro? Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming today. Um, I, I live in Richmond, Virginia. I work uh, the East Coast for the rain screen specialist uh, role within Stoke Orphan. Thank you. And if you have any questions, comments, uh, feel free to drop those in the chat as we go along. Brock will be looking out for those and he will uh, grab my attention if uh, anything relevant comes up. Um, but this is an AIA accredited course, so we are going to try and remain as agnostic as possible um, and avoid using branded language as we go through. So most of those questions, if they are Stowe specific, we're going to hold on to till the end. Just to give you a quick overview, because I'm sure most of you know the Stowe name, but probably don't know what we do. 
Um, Stow Ventec is our rain screen program. It's been around for the better part of two decades in on the European side of our business, which is our cradle. Uh, we brought it over here to the U.S. a few years ago. We have a very different approach to rain screen philosophy from other manufacturers. Um, so we are kind of a separate arm from the East and Stucco business that I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. Um, we're not going to be discussing uh, East and Stucco today. We're going to be solely on rain screen. So I encourage you to share any questions, comments, concerns in the chat, and we will get to those as and when we can. Uh, we've been asked, can we send out the whole slide deck? I don't think you want 78 slides. It's going to clog up your email. Um, and also, the AIA is not keen on entire presentations floating around in the ether uh, and people trying to give themselves credits. Uh, we do have some Handleywood courses available online if you want to uh, take those courses on demand. That said, Brock and I are always happy to uh, present these uh, either virtually or in person for your firm. So if you like what you see today, you want to do it again with your colleagues, just let us know. Um, and if you want a specific infographic or something, there are um, plenty of files on ASLAB and uh, there's a slide number on the bottom left-hand corner of every slide. So if there's something that you specifically want more details on, uh, just jot that down and get in touch with us afterwards and we can help you out. Again, this is an AIA accredited course, which means um, we're not going to do anything manufacturer specific until the course is completed. So we have four learning objectives today. First one is we are going to, uh, actually before we even get into these rain screen objectives, these four objectives, we're gonna talk about history of rain screen. I think it's gotten kind of confusing here in the States. It's become this kind of trendy buzzword, rain screen, but not everybody knows what it is. So we're gonna do a quick history lesson. It's actually not new technology by any stretch of the imagination. Um, then our first learning objective, we're going to go through uh, the complete or system, full system assembly approach versus the components based or incomplete approach. And we'll look at some uh, wall section details that illustrate each of those. Then we'll get into the control layers of the building for envelopes, starting at the substrate, working our way out to the finish. Then we're going to back it up to the substrate again and go through the system layers unique to a rain screen. Then we'll get into some of the testing um, that is unique to the rain screen system and particularly relevant to health safety and welfare this course the course is hsw accredited for those of you who are looking for it and finally we're actually going to walk through the spec process uh, from the standpoint of an architect what it looks like currently versus what it could and should look like uh, i promised a history lesson i will keep it brief and i will keep it interesting so this should look familiar to everyone. This is generally how we were constructing buildings up until more recently, and it's mass wall construction. So the idea was we're gonna build a ginormous wall, and if the wall is super big, then we're not gonna have transmission of uh, moisture or uh, temperature from the exterior to the interior and vice versa. What we actually ended up doing was building a giant thermal bridge, and we were right. We did not have transmission all the way from the interior to the exterior and vice versa. We had it partway through the wall where the dew point was, and moisture would hang out there. And during the day when the temperatures are above freezing, the water would be in liquid form. And then in the evening when the temperatures would bottom out below freezing, that water would freeze, it would expand, and it would cause cracking and spalling and basically destroy the wall from the inside out. And we see a lot of these failing masonry and mass wall buildings um, all around the globe and certainly in uh, urban centers. I'm based in New York. We have a lot of these failing buildings near me. Um, so then we came up with this other idea of instead of building one giant wall, what if we built two separate walls, an outer wall, an inner wall, and a cavity between the two? And I did mention it is not new. It is not trendy. It is not a buzzword. Um, we started experimenting with rain screen assembly as early as the 1100s in Norway. In the mid 1900s is when we started to see it really pick up steam in Europe and Canada. And by the 1980s, we saw it being very widely used in Canada and Europe. And so in the early 2000s, we had some manufacturers in that space that were trying to bring their products over to the U.S. And they would come over with a panel and clip and say, look, I have a rain screen by my rain screen. Look at this awesome rain screen. They did not have a rain screen. They had cladding and a clip, which is a component of a rain screen. But because they were playing it fast and loose with that term, 
nobody really knew what the rain screen was anymore. Is it the clip? Is it the void space? Is it the panel? What exactly is it? So an organization was formed at the beginning of 2020 called the Rain Screen Association in North America. And they made it their goal to provide educational information to the North American markets so that they could really understand the science behind the rain screen and how best to execute. And their first order of business was, we're going to define this. We're going to define it properly. So their definition is that a rain screen is defined as an assembly applied to an exterior wall, which consists of, at minimum, an outer layer, an inner layer, and a cavity between the two, sufficient for passive removal of condensate, as well as bulk water penetration, like from precipitation outside the building. It's been defined as a single exterior building skin material. That's cladding. That's not a rain screen. That's just the facade panel. A collection of individual components aimed at functioning as a system. I affectionately call this the Frankenstein system. It's how we design our rain screens currently in the US. Usually the way it looks is you will have um, a cladding manufacturer, somebody who has a panel, you'll have somebody that makes some rails and some brackets, you'll have somebody else that makes an air and moisture barrier, and somebody else that makes some insulation, maybe somebody else to do sealants or fasteners, and you cobble them together into a completely untested system and put it up on the wall and hope that it works. And then lastly, you have, um, it's a building science principle. That's the one that resonates most with me. It's not one or 10 manufacturers. It is the philosophy of having exterior wall, interior wall, cavity between the two. And there are different types of rain screens as well. And there are tests for each of these. We have the drained and back ventilated rain screen, Truth be told, I'm not keen on this detail. It's two by fours with lap siding over it. But technically, because there is unrestricted air movement behind that lap siding, uh, that is a DBV. Um, it is tested under the AMA 509, which we'll talk about later in the presentation. Uh, and it's sometimes referred to as an open joint system. Then we have the pressure equalized. This also, I'm not crazy about this detail or this description because it insinuates that the only way to have a pressure equalized system is that you need air dams. That's how the pressure equalized systems started. It was metal panels going up as a rain screen, really high in the air, excessive wind loading, and they had to keep these um, very lightweight aerodynamic panels from flying off the building. So they use air dams to kind of mitigate that wind loading on the wall. Uh, that doesn't mean that to get a pressure equalized or occasionally referred to as a closed joint rain screen that you need those air dams in there. It just means that you are restricting or controlling how much movement and in which direction. And then we have this, which is not a rain screen. It would not pass an AMA 508 or 509 test. There is no ventilation back there. There's no airflow. There is a drainage mat, which provides a capillary leak function, um, which is reliance on gravity. We're hoping that you know water will fall down to the bottom and find its way to, um, to the bottom of the drainage mat. Um, and it, it may be a solid assembly as far as moisture management, but it is not a rain screen and it would not pass the classification test. Uh, as far as functions of rain screen, we refer to them as the three Ds. We want to deflect, drain, and dry. Uh, then we have some underlying functions, which are going to be a direct result of different selections that you make through the spec process. Uh, water management, you're always going to have, because if it doesn't have a vent cavity, it's not a rain screen anymore. It is something else. Uh, structural integrity is going to be a function of what cladding you choose. And let's say your design intent is to go with a wood look. Well, there's a lot of different facade materials out there. Some are more durable than others. Some have things like bomb blast testing and missile impact testing through the Miami D. Um, and they all may look like a cedar plank, but they're not all going to be up to the performance standards that you need. So make sure that you're looking at the right product for your specific project in, um, in addition to preserving design intent. Energy conservation, that's gonna be a function of a thermally broken subconstruction system and outbound insulation. And finally, fire mitigation. Um, we have different ways of fire blocking that are unique to a rain screen system, uh, such as intumescent strips and lamella. A lamella is a very dense block of mineral wool that we use to basically provide blocking for the intumescent strip, which is a form of tape that when it comes into contact with a 
high heat of a fire, it actually expands and it dams up your air gap, which chokes off that chimney effect. So why pick a rain screen? Um, first of all, aesthetics. You're not at the mercy of your substrate anymore. You can pretty much create all these unique shapes and profiles to the building or get a perfectly plain wall where there was none. And you can pick a lot of unique uh, shapes and graphics and things like that that you can't necessarily do uh, with a direct apply system. Uh, you mitigate the risk of harmful condensation and humidity, improve energy and thermal efficiency, provide drainage and drying, and extend the life of the facade. You mitigate the risk of wall assembly failures. These are all functions of that, that air gap. The number one way that buildings are attacked is water intrusion. It either corrodes out things like wall ties, it could expand and crack um, whatever masonry you've got going on back there, it could just hang out and grow new species behind your cladding um, and in the gap, which impacts things like indoor air quality. Um, the, the number way, the number one way the buildings fail are is usually going to be a function of um, either insidious condensate moving back and forth or just bulk water penetration getting into a leak um, and causing damage over time. Your control layers are protected from UV with a rain screen. There are some systems where if you expose or some air and moisture barriers where if you expose them to UV, they become pretty much useless. Um, and some rain screens can be panelized because we're already riding on subconstruction. It just lends itself really well to prefab. All right, so now that we've finished our history lesson, before we get into the learning objectives, I just wanna make sure everybody is still with me and awake. Um, if you could go ahead and answer the poll question that's about to pop up, how are you designing your rain screens today? And E, I don't use rain screens is a perfectly valid answer. I'll give you guys a couple minutes to answer that. All right, well, I think we're good. I hope we're good. <laughs> Assuming we have any answers at all, <laughs> you can go ahead and pull them. Got quite a few. I'm gonna give folks one right. second because I noticed a few last minute coming in. All right, all right. cool. Now I'm cutting it off. <laughs> cool. Don't worry, there will be another poll question. So if you miss this one, and you're getting like FOMO. We'll we'll give you another poll question in a little bit. Totally. All right. Do you want me to share the results with everyone so folks can see? Yeah, go for it. I'm curious. Yeah, that sounds about right. So it depends on my audience, but for my architects and my designers, usually you are going to start with the aesthetic of the building and then work out a way to hang it on the wall um, safely and within code. Um, and yeah, the, the second runner up is going to be budget. Obviously, you can spec the best system in the whole wide world, but if it's not in the budget to pay for it, um, then it's just not going to happen. So thank you all for sharing that. I really appreciate it. All right, so we're going to jump right into learning objective one now. I keep using these terms complete versus incomplete, system versus component. You might see these symbols pop up. They're all referring to kind of the same thing. Um, and I could just run my mouth and say, like, oh, full systems are better and component systems are dangerous. But I'd rather show you wall section details and actual projects where these things have caused failure. So with the component approach, I refer to that as the by others approach or the Frankenstein approach. And basically in, in a situation like that, you're specking multiple manufacturers together into one envelope. Their parts and pieces are um, integrating directly with each other, but they may not necessarily be compatible with each other. And then if something fails, they can hide behind the other manufacturers rather than taking responsibility. Um, so this is a good example of a manufacturer that doesn't understand rain screen. So I have a detail here from an air and moisture barrier manufacturer. They created this membrane. They bill it as something that can go behind a rain screen. But there's something critical that's missing 
from this detail. First of all, I want you to note as we go through all these details, how many times it says by others. And by others is a veiled way of saying, this is the architect's problem and responsibility. Um, but the thing that's missing here are fasteners. We're not adhesively applying these sea girts to the substrate. We are mechanically fastening our subconstruction through the barrier and into whatever the substrate is, whatever structural is back there. Because we're mechanically fastening, we want to ensure that that air and moisture barrier truly is suitable to go behind a rain screen and it should have nail sealability testing. Now this manufacturer, I'm not quite sure that they do have that test because they don't even show the fasteners going through their membrane in their detail. Here's another one. This subconstruction manufacturer might be really good. However, um, we have no way of knowing what the heck it is because they've not really called anything out. Um, first of all, they've got this kind of vague panel that's attached. They're not saying what it's made out of or how much it weighs or how thick it is. Like they're just kind of showing a face fastened panel, just arbitrarily attached. I also want to call out the sheer volume of per architect callouts. They are directly making you responsible if anything goes wrong with this building. It will be your problem. You are the one holding the bag now because you're the one that's selecting everything. Um, the other thing that I want to point out is they're not even taking responsibility for the one thing that they should be taking responsibility for. Subconstruction is meant to anchor the, fast, the uh, facade panels to the wall. It is meant to create space to accommodate the rain screen gap as well as the insulation. Um, and they're not taking ownership of that because call out number eight says fastener spacing edge distance and open panel joint dimension per panel manufacturer. No, you are the ones with the load table. You are the ones carrying that load. So you should be doing the calculations and saying, hey, for this particular facade panel, you are going to need X number of brackets per square foot. But they're not doing that. They're foisting that responsibility on you and on likely a very costly engineer that's going to have to figure that out for you. Um, this detail is not even physically possible. It's a Z-girt going into bad insulation. There's no sheathing. There's no air and moisture barrier. There's no rain screen gap. There's no cladding. It's just Z-girts. Then we have this one, which again, could be a really good system, but we don't know what it is. Facade panel manufacturers take responsibility for the aesthetic of the building, and that's about it. So anything behind that, anything that's really providing the structural for their panel, they're not gonna own. The architect's gonna have to own that. Um, this is actually one that I'm fairly familiar with. It's a closed joint rain screen system. Uh, it's a fiber cement panel and they ship lap into each other with a um, clip in between. First thing I wanna point out here is the gap is very small compared to the other details that we looked at. Canada recognizes a three eighths of an inch air gap. They've done extensive testing on this and they do approve it. Um, however, I've not seen it in anything other than a closed joint system, uh, which this is. The thing I wanna point out here, in addition to the fact that they really just sell you a panel anchor to panel and nothing else, um, so that's a lot of stuff that you have to source from other people, and that's going to cost a lot of money. It's at, like an added palm that you need to grease each time you go to another manufacturer. Um, but because it's ship lapped, it really limits you from an aesthetic standpoint. You can go horizontal or you can go vertical. And if you're going to go vertical, you have to make sure that the furring or whatever structural you're screwing into is the fixed dimension on the short side of these panels. So it really is quite limiting. So this is what happens when you use these by other details because the details themselves are sloppy, but I wanna see what happens when we field apply them. Uh, this was a metal panel beside that I'm sure somebody spent a lot of money on and they walked the site just after it went up and they were ticked, like ownership spent money and it looks like pretty wonky. So Morrison Hirschfield was called in to investigate. They determined it was improper detailing um, and improper use of the facade layer uh, between the facade panels and the subconstruction. Usually our subcon 
um, in supporting the panels is also kind of absorbing any movement so that we don't see that movement on the outside. In this case, the building is settling somewhere and these panels are walking and owner's mad. They want it taken down. They want it fixed. But who's going to pay for that? Well, the panel guy is going to say the subconstruction guy should pay for it and vice versa. And at the end of the day, none of it's going to get done. And this is where I lose sleep. So this was a natural stone panel. It fell away from the parapet, crash landed on somebody's balcony, took out the glass guardrail in the process. And thank goodness nobody was hurt. But they easily could have been. And we have an entire building that is clad in the same exact system. With natural stone, it's very tricky. You have to be really careful with how you anchor. There should be a protective mesh on the back, which there obviously wasn't because we don't see any mesh um, on the shattered piece of stone. Um, if that mesh were on, it actually would have held it to the building um, intact, shattered in place, uh, which is not what happened here. We have to be mindful of how we anchor as well because stone, when it heats up during the day, it expands. When it cools down in the evening, it contracts. So depending on how you anchor, if it's expanding and contracting, you're going to cause stress fractures around that point of anchor, and eventually it will crack and fall away like this one did. Um, and that's what Morris and Hirschfield determined in their assessment, that there was a thermal mismatch between materials, um, and it gradually stressed the, um, the stone, and causing it to fall. Uh, no one's going to want to take responsibility for this. The whole building needs a probe. There's the possibility that it all needs to come down. Um, this, this is a direct risk to occupant and bystander safety and welfare. Uh, there's no way anyone's going to want to take ownership. So we looked at some kind of credit details, and now I want to go through some system details. Um, names have been redacted here, but every time you see a green circle, that is denoting that it's coming from a single source that is tested as one single assembly. It comes with one single warranty. So this one in particular is an opaque glass rain screen system. This part, um, uh, the this panel that's hanging is uh, prefabricated to shop, shop drawing uh, specifications. And then everything from the attachment profile back is going to be field applied. I want to point out that this is calling out the air and moisture barrier as part of the system. It is calling out any profiles as part of the system, all of the screws. These are things that normally would um, be third party. So it's all coming as one fully tested system. And this is what you can do with that. This particular design would be a challenge to execute if you were working with multiple manufacturers, but because it's one manufacturer, it's one point of contact, they know their load tables, they know their capabilities, um, they're able to engineer this on their end. So they're taking the responsibility for their own stuff. And a good manufacturer, while glass is very pretty, um, will have other options for you. So in this case, um, that same board that our glass was riding on, on the previous detail, is now being fastened directly to the T-profile. We've eliminated those, uh, eliminated those two rails, and we're applying a base coat mesh and finish system directly to it. So that board, um, which by the way, is primarily post-consumer recycled glass granulate, is now acting as a blank canvas for us. And we can ride plaster finishes on it, we can ride masonry veneer on it, there's a lot of things that we can do there. We can get very versatile. Uh, these boards have some play to them, or you can score them if you have a particularly tight radius that you want to ride. Um, I want to point out that because this is a full system, a full assembly, ideally you're going to have one sub that's doing the whole thing. So they know where their structural is. They know what their spacing is. They know you know, what steps were done before them because they're the ones that applied it. And just generally, the less cooks you have in the kitchen, the less expensive things are. Um, so just to recap, generally the system approach is going to be better. It's certainly um, more risk averse for our architects. It's taking that responsibility and placing it squarely on the shoulders of the uh, manufacturer, which is where it belongs. We're, we're the ones that are designing the products and we should own how they perform. So now we're going to get into learning objective two. This is essentially a crash course on building science. And we'll start with the general control layers. 
So we're going to start from our substrate. It might be sheathing. It could be existing masonry. It could be CMU. It could be concrete shear. Whatever the substrate is, we're going to start at the face of that and work our way out to the aesthetic side. The um, five control layers in any building, or four, depending on what climate zone you're in, are vapor barrier, air barrier, water penetration barrier, thermal barrier, and durability and water shutting layer. Now we'll get into each of those. So the air and water penetration barrier is going to be on every project. And it's usually going to be one material that's doing multiple things. It's not going to be three separate barriers. Um, it could be a fluid applied. It could be a peel and stick. There's a lot of different, um, that could be sheet good. There's a lot of different ways to do this. Not every project should have a vapor barrier because vapor barriers are installed on the warm side of the wall. So if you're in a climate zone like mine up in the Northeast, half of the year, the warm side of the wall is on the outside like it is right now. But in the winter, the warm side of the wall is going to be on the inside when you've got the heat cranked up and it's 30 degrees out. So when that flip-flop happens, you're now trapping condensate somewhere in the middle of that assembly. Whereas if we didn't have that barrier, we're encouraging that moisture to permeate through. It's going to want to find the dew point. The dew point in a rain screen is the cavity. It is an air gap that is directly outbound of the um, continuous outbound insulation. That is your dew point in the wall. Has hashtag signs. Um, speaking of thermal barrier. So there are a lot of different insulation options out there. When we are talking rain screen, it should be non-combustible and not NFPA 285 non-combustible. It should be fully non-combustible. You're putting adjacent to an air gap. It's extremely dangerous to put something flammable adjacent to an air gap. If you would not line the walls of your chimney or your fireplace with it, it has no business going in a rain screen. And then finally, we have our durability and water shedding layer. Uh, this is a fancy pants way of saying cladding. It should be beautiful. It should win you tons of awards and notoriety. We should be able to take pretty pictures of it. It's also the first line of defense for the building. So it needs to be waterproof. It needs to be impact resistant. It needs to serve um, whatever purpose um, is necessary for your specific project. So for example, an airport terminal versus a school, these are gonna have uh, different performance requirements for their cladding. So now we're gonna back it up to the substrate and we're gonna go through like this is a rain screen system. So you'll notice some of the control layers are gonna be augmented. Um, or we're going to have additional layers added on. Uh, system layer one doesn't change. We have our air and moisture barrier. But I want you to note that the terms that we're using here are not barriers so much as control. We want to allow condensate to permeate. We want to control air movement. We want to control bulk water movement. That is our goal. Because we want everything in the end to wind up in our drainage plane. Then we have our subconstruction. We discussed that this serves multiple purposes. One is to affix the cladding. Um, uh, one is to create the gap for our insulation, which is gonna vary depending on what R value you're trying to achieve. And one is to create the additional space for your rain screen cavity. And we'll talk about the depth of that as we go through. When people ask how much things cost, I usually point them in this direction. It's going to depend on what you're hanging, how heavy it is, and how high we're going, what wind load zone we're in. Because, for example, you may have two subconstruction manufacturers, A and B. A's parts and pieces generally are cheaper than manufacturer B. But you're hanging terracotta panels, and you're doing it in Miami-Dade County on a 40-story building. Probably not because there's a height restriction in Miami, but I digress. Let's call it a 15-story building. Very high wind loads very heavy material. Um, when they do the calculations, it actually would have been cheaper for you to use manufacturer B because their material is stronger, it's more thermally efficient, um, you need less of their metal, less of their parts and pieces to do the same job. So the best way to determine how much something costs for your project is to send a set of, of um, plans at least some elevations, some wall sections, give us an idea of what you're doing um, and let us run a takeoff. 
quotes cost zero dollars, you should be able to know, you know, what kind of road you're walking down before you start walking down it. Uh, then we have our insulation. I don't even like that this slide mentions foam plastics because now that we're into the system layers of a rain screen, it has no business being there. Um, we should have non-combustible insulation back there. Something like a mineral wool is ideal. Um, additionally, if we can add fire breaks, all better. And this is also going to uh, affect your costs. For example, let's say that you need an R16 for your project. Well, there's a few different ways we can do that. You can have four inches of insulation and go to a stainless steel bracket. Stainless steel is obviously going to be more expensive than aluminum. Or if you have the lot line allowance and if mineral wool is cheaper at that point than steel is, then maybe you could go to five inches of mineral insulation and do aluminum brackets. And you should be able to kind of price it both ways and see what works best within your budget. So our next system layer is gonna be your vent cavity. This is what defines the rain screen as a rain screen. I did mention that Canada recognizes three eighths of an inch air gap. They've done extensive testing. The European standard is usually between 20 and 50 millimeters. That's about seven eighths of an inch to about two inches. We do not have a, year, a US standard. The US doesn't understand rain screen, generally speaking. Um, it is the wild west, you can make it up as you go. Uh, there are test methods uh, for the specific performance of this cavity, and we'll talk about those in the next section. Generally, the pressure difference is going to cause that air to go this way, and we call it a chimney effect sometimes, which is why it's so critical that whatever insulation you're putting adjacent is fully non-combustible. That said, the NFPA test is still important, and we'll talk about why. Uh, your last system layer is going to be your facade panel. Um, should be highly durable, should be um, aesthetically pleasing and meet your design intent. There's a lot of different ways to clad the building. We've got metal, we've got um, cementitious panels, um, like a fiber cement. We've got uh, HPL, natural stone, masonry, porcelain, glass. Um, plaster applied, there's a lot of different ways to do this. So you wanna ensure that you're doing it in a way that ticks both boxes. Um, on this side, I wanna point out the um, middle picture and the uh, one on the right. I wish that we had more and prettier images on this, but unfortunately I get two glass buildings and plaster applied, so that's what we're working with today. Um, I want to point out the middle one because it does use a specialized finish that is stop so glass. It's a mirrored finish. I often get asked at that point about bird safety. So um, usually when we're talking about bird safe glass, we're referring to vision glass rather than opaque glass because a bird will think that it can continue flying directly through the vision glass and onto the other side. They won't recognize the barrier and that's usually where they will strike the glass. Um, so opaque glass is not, or back painted, is not subjected to uh, the same safety requirements as vision glass from a bird safety standpoint. That said, I personally would not put money on the idea that a bird wouldn't fly into the stop so glass. And there is um, an additional safeguard that we can put um, a pattern that we can print on the glass that um, birds can see and humans cannot, depending on what side we put on and what graphic we use. So you can still use a mirrored glass. Sorry, the other one I wanna point out is all the way on the far right. We're using an extremely dark color. We've disguised our control joints. Uh, so it looks pretty seamless. That color with um, a very low LRV, light reflectance value and a very high pigment load would not be permitted in an EAST assembly, for example, because of the excessive heat loading on the building, it will cause the boards underneath to warp. However, because we have the rain screen going underneath that, we have an air gap, we have a continuous non-combustible um, insulation, uh, thermal barrier back there. Uh, so we can go to very dark colors with very high pigment loads without concerns about heat loading. So just to recap, we have our AMB, our subconstruction, our outbound insulation, our vent cavity, and finally our facade. And I promised you guys another poll question. Some people missed it, so here it is.
I'm going to ask it just slightly differently from the way it's written, actually. Who would you say has the final hammer stroke um, on a rain screen? Who's, who's kind of driving that buzz? Give everybody a few minutes to answer. How are we doing over there, Bo? We're doing well. Looks like we've got a good amount of people who have answered. So we'll give everyone one or two more seconds and then uh, end our. Cool. All right. That means people are still awake. Thank you. I think people are awake. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. If you have the budget for an envelope consultant, that is awesome. Um, I We love our envelope consultants. They are extremely knowledgeable, well-respected, and they are subject matter experts on your behalf. So definitely use them. I agree that the architect should kind of be driving the bus on that. I'm a little shocked to see people answer manufacturer. Um, love that, <laughs> but it's way above my pay grade to design buildings. <laughs> I'm more than happy to provide information um, and that really is the manufacturer's responsibility. They shouldn't be strong arming anyone into specifying anything. They should be providing information and then letting you all do what you do best um, and going ahead and specifying and designing the building. That's cool though. All right, thanks Bo. All right, so we're gonna get into learning objective three. We're gonna talk a little bit about testing. Um, and the relationship between the building envelope and health, safety, and welfare. I'm gonna skip around a little bit in this section. So first of all, start as early as possible in the design process. It does not hurt my feelings. I can't speak for every manufacturer, but for me, it does not hurt my feelings for you to contact me in schematic phase for a project that's four years out to talk about whether this is a, a good, healthy road to walk down with your particular project, if it's a good fit, um, and then you call me three years later and go, hey, the project's dead. I'd much rather that happen than, you know, what I've been getting, which is a lot of darn, I wish you'd come into my office six months ago. Call early, call often. Um, this way we can ensure that it actually meets your project requirements. I don't like sitting around peg into a square hole. If it's not a good fit, I'm going to tell you so. Some of the most lucrative projects are the ones we walk away from. Um, think about the entire system, system versus component. I think we got that across pretty solidly. And finally, work with the project team on sequencing. This is particularly critical if you insist on using the Frankenstein method or the components method. Um, manufacturers do not hang out on the weekends or like go golfing with each other, especially if they're competitive manufacturers. So let's say you've got um, a bracket manufacturer that's six weeks out and a panel manufacturer that's 10 weeks out, um, an air and moisture barrier manufacturer that's two weeks out, and then you've got this fastener, this specific fastener that you need, and you're not going to get them for eight and a half weeks. They're not going to call each other to work out what needs to be ordered and on site and when to deploy it. Whereas if somebody's shipping everything, they've got the logistics to know that they need to send this at this point and this at, during this phase and kind of work with you on that. Um, same thing with, uh, are the windows going in first or is the facade going first? What does that detail look like? Uh, the thing I want to point out on this slide is the pre-cut meeting or mock-up. First of all, have them, but second of all, please don't call out flat walls for your mock-ups. <laughs> call out whatever the trickiest possible detail is. If there's something funky going on at the window jam or some weird transition between two cladding materials or something bizarre at the power pit, like choose that detail 
let's build that as the field built mock-up because if they can nail that detail in a field built uh, condition, then the flat wall is not gonna be the issue. All right, so now we're gonna get into all that testing. The OSHRAE 90.1, I don't put a lot of emphasis on anymore. It was issued in 2018 and it was kind of like the federal government's way of saying, hey, wouldn't it be lovely if we all used continuous outbound insulation on our projects? Um, a lot of the local codes have exceeded the R values in the OSHRAE. Uh, I know in New York, the energy code's been like up two or three times since the OSHRAE code's been issued. Um, so most local jurisdictions are, are going to exceed these values and you're gonna wanna check with the local code. I've mentioned this classification test, so I kinda wanna get into like what it is and how it works. This is the AMA 508 and 509. This is what's telling you, yes, this really is a rating screen. Um, when all of those manufacturers were coming over from abroad, the American Architectural Manufacturers Association noticed that they were grabbing tests like the um, ASTME 330 wind load test for windows, doors, curtain walls, skylights, and the AMA 501 dynamic water pressure test, which is for windows, doors, curtain walls, skylights. These are all important tests to have, but none of them actually tested the cavity itself. So you got people running around going, yeah, drainage plane, lots of airflow, lots of ventilation, it's going to keep your building dry. But no one was actually measuring that. So AMA came up with an iteration of their 501 dynamic pressure test that also measures the ventilation behind the cladding to determine that there is indeed airflow back there. The 508 is for your pressure equalized or closed joint. The 509 is for your drained and back ventilated or your open joint. Um, this particular result, you can see that red box in the upper left-hand corner. That means it's a really good result. We're not getting any water really making it beyond the cavity um, or collecting anywhere. We have very high levels of ventilation, like very high levels of airflow uh, behind the cladding. So that's a very good result. You still need the ASTME 330. That's your wind load test. It's what's gonna tell you, hey, you need X number of brackets per square foot um, on this particular material. What we want to see with this test is like stud deformation at 240 miles an hour. We do not wanna see fastener pull out and panels flying through the air at 75 miles an hour. Um, we vacuum seal the test specimen, we mimic wind loading in both directions, and we wait until we hear a pop. And whatever the wind pressure was when we heard that pop, that's where it failed. So I mentioned the NFPA 285 is a, a system test and not a component test. That said, even though we are only ever using non-combustible insulation with a rain screen system um, on the outbound side, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still get an NFPA 285, especially when you're using the Frankenstein method, because you don't know that there isn't um, another component somewhere in that assembly that is combustible. Or if you put these two manufacturers components next to each other and then expose them to very high heat, that it doesn't generate a new material that becomes combustible. Uh, the NFPA 285 test is the two-story fire assembly test we have a burner on the header of the first story window and a burner in the center of the first story room. We ignite and extinguish them at different times and we observe the fire. The S134 Canadian test is a longer version of this test and it includes fire breaks around the windows. Essentially, what we wanna be able to do is predict that we have enough time for occupants to get out of the building safely and for first responders to get into the building safely. So we can't see flame propagation into the second story and we can't see excessive smoke propagation. Again, it is not a component test, it is a system test. So if a component manufacturer tells, that, tells you that they have the NFPA 285, you're gonna want the test report because if you wanna use a different manufacturer than the ones that they partnered with on the test, you need to get an engineering judgment from a qualified fire safety engineer. Uh, in my neck of the woods, I did mention that we have a lot of failing masonry buildings, and um, this is how we <laughs> try and mitigate them as best we can. Uh, this is the FISC program, the Facade Inspection and Safety Program. It's actually the oldest facade ordinance in the country. 
started in 1980 after a college student was tragically killed by a piece of terracotta that fell off of a historic building in 79. And this is why we have that. So every five years, buildings of six or more stories need to be inspected just for the structural stability of their cladding. Because we have a lot of these buildings where we're missing wall ties, the wall ties are failing, freeze thaw is causing crack, cracking or spalling. Um, and these can cause really dangerous conditions like full sheets of brick falling on cars or people, God forbid. So um, if a facade fails their fist of inspection, the building owner has X amount of time to shore up or fix it, um, or they may be forced to evacuate. EPA does mention rain screen in two of their guidelines. One is multifamily, one is school, because if you don't have standing water in the wall, you don't have mold and mold to grow. I'm going to skip ahead a smidgen. So um, we can see already, at least in the Northeast, the codes, the building codes are changing. We are due another iteration of the ICC next year. Um, we're anticipating some energy codes shifting in the direction of passive house. And I think a lot of architects are anticipating that. Um, up here, we're seeing some changes to the fire code, which you may see roll out to the rest of the country. Uh, generally, if you're working with one manufacturer, it makes it much easier to get out in front of those code changes so you don't have to go back into redesign when um, something shifts. We're experiencing a labor shortage. We're still having trouble with supply chain, although it's not as bad as it's been in the past. Um, same with like freight costs fluctuate, like a freight quote is as good as the paper that's printed on for about eight and a half seconds and then it changes. Um, so a, a really good way to kind of work around those um, is working with uh, one fully tested system. Um, also up in certain climate zones, we lose months out of the year to weather. So um, it's easier for us uh, to, to work around that. Um, if you're using something like offsite construction, which dovetails really nicely with rain screens. So for this last section, I'm gonna kind of walk through what the spec process looks like for you. Anytime you're specifying any product, you have a lot of documentation um, and a lot of research and a lot of time and effort, um, which Bo pointed out beautifully with how Ace Lab kind of cuts out all of that admin work. Um, hopefully by using less manufacturers, you can also kind of cut out a lot of that extra admin work and the extra leg work. The less manufacturers, the less subs you have involved, the less likely it is that you're going to hit a collision, um, i.e. something is not compatible with something else, um, and it reduces the risk of construction delays and improves project delivery. Uh, and that's true of anything. It could be your interior finishes or your exterior finishes. So the rain screen assembly is the sum of the um, exterior cavity. We've got our control layers, our component layers, and our vent cavities. So if I were using the Frankenstein method, conservatively, I'm working with four manufacturers, air and moisture barrier, subconstruction, CI, and the facade. The vent cavity is an absence of material, so I don't count that as a manufacturer. Odds are you're going to have more than four. You're going to have like maybe a fastener person or maybe two or three subconstruction manufacturers. Maybe you only have one person for the full air and moisture barrier and somebody else for the liquid flashings. Um, we're gonna conservatively say four. Every time you spec something, you need a three-part specification, product documentation, detail submittals, warranties, test reports, engineering judgments, code approvals, POs, invoices, et cetera. And now you need to do that for each of these four manufacturers. And there's a chance that somewhere in there, in this pile of work that you've done, that there's actually a statement that says, hey, you can't use this air and moisture barrier behind this particular cladding. But how would you know? Because it's buried. <laughs> um, it's a lot of legwork. It's a lot of different people that you're now having to conduct and coordinate. And that's just for homogenous building, which it's rare that we're doing those nowadays. Usually you're going to have at least two finishes on a building. We're not designing giant windowless boxes. You're probably going to have at least a type of cladding on the podium and maybe something else above. So let's say you already had a lot of um, leg work to do with the single aesthetic facade and you already have some concerns about compatibility with that. 
Um, now, hypothetically, the glass manufacturer here says you have to use the peel and stick and the plaster manufacturer says, no, you got to use the fluid applied. What happens when those two barriers meet? Usually what we see happen is a leak in the building six months later and a call back. Um, so for me, at least, Green Screen Design is about managing risk. Somebody should be owning the chassis of the building. It shouldn't matter what aesthetics you're using or how many. The control layers and the system layers should be continuously enveloping the building. There shouldn't be a break at any point in time. So regardless of whether you're using a single or dual facade, if you're using the complete approach, you now have a fully adjustable system that is designed and tested and warranted to go together. It's coming from one source that you need to coordinate with. You have assured compatibility across components, assured testing. It's been tested repeatedly, both in the field and in controlled settings for so many different conditions. Less documentation, um, far less coordination. A lot of that heavy lifting is now being done by the architect. And your risk is now reduced because instead of calling out by others or per architect, it's pointing the finger squarely at your manufacturer, your one manufacturer. So just to recap, one warranty from a single supplier, assured compatibility of components, fully tested assemblies for fire, structural, thermal, um, missile impact, uh, explosives testing, soft body, hard body impact testing. Um, there's a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what happened? Where my arrow go? Weather tight transitions because we have one air and moisture barrier. There are no buy others collisions because it's not by others anymore. And one phone call to make. So we finished all of our learning objectives. Sabo pop up. Hi. Much Kate for running through that. That was really awesome. Uh, hey. Always am very impressed to watch someone just continuously talk for an hour. I think um, <laughs> it's not easy to do. Um, but I'm a Long great. Islander, so I find it very easy. Oh, that's always good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know we've got a bunch of Q&A. Um, I also want to let everyone know I launched our poll. So if you would like to receive samples, um, you know, follow up info, if you've got questions about lead times, price quotes, um, feel free to fill out that poll. We will connect you with uh, the Stove and Tech team right over on the ACE Lab portal. Um, and yeah, let's uh, get into some of these questions while we still have a few minutes left. Sweet. All right. Um, I don't know if Brock, you have any preferences on where we start, but I will just go ahead and start with the first one. Um, and it says, it appears that you're looking for specific product systems to be specified. This makes sense. But what do you do with public tender projects where you can't write CDs around a proprietary system? I get that question in basically every single presentation that I do. It's tricky, if I'm honest. Um, because theoretically, you're putting four different divisions of the spec together as in one. We have the air and moisture barrier spec. We have some metal in there for the subcon. We have whatever the cladding material is. You've got a, a UV insulation. There's a lot going on in there. Um, and you're right. For public projects, you're not supposed to lock it. I've seen people write it as an or equal um, and just kind of, or I've seen people put generic performance specs and we can help provide that language if you want to kind of steer it in the right direction. Um, generally speaking, when even if you put competitors for each of those divisions or each of those individual components, if you parse it out that way, um, from a pricing standpoint, we'll kind of beat them up on the VE side anyway. So usually it, it'll work out okay. We're also happy to be very involved throughout the bid process um, to ensure that it goes where you want it to go. Cool. Quick note, just wanted to let folks know who are answering the poll. Um, if you request samples or you specify that it's for an active project, there'll be a quick post-event survey. Um, if you could give us the address to send those samples to, as well as a project name, that would be great. Um, all right, moving on. This is just a nice note from someone, but wanted to mention it. Uh, awesome presentation. First time they've really understood rain screens. So Sweet. <laughs> that made my whole day. I don't know who wrote that, but thank you. <laughs> Paul. So thank you, Paul. Um, 
All right, and then let's see. I know we're at time, but maybe we've got a moment for one more question. Um, how about, okay, interesting. Um, does Stowe have preferred envelope consult consultants for the California region? Oh, that's a really good one. Um, not preferred. We don't, we don't try to, we try and remain agnostic in everything we do. We're like Switzerland. Um, yeah. But we've definitely got some some wall consultants that we've worked with in California, for sure, that we have good relationships with. Um, you can get with me offline. And, and Bo has my contact information. Um, and Brox is up on the ACE Lab landing page. Um, and we can get you connected if you're looking for somebody. Awesome. Great. OK, cool. Well, I know we're all at time, so um, if it's okay with you, Kate. We will just have a record of the rest of these questions. I know there's a few that we didn't get to, um, so we can follow up with you post-event to answer your specific okay. questions. Um, and yeah, just wanted to thank everyone so much for their participation today um, and for joining us. It's really great to uh, see so many folks out here and participating in our polls. Um, so really appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Kate and Brock, for an amazing presentation today. Our pleasure. Thanks for facilitating Bo and Ace Lab. We appreciate you. Of course. All right. Have a great Tuesday, everyone.